Okay, let's get started. It's the uh, 88th Security Thought Leadership webinar today. And uh, we started off doing five and we're at 88 uh, because it seems as though we've hit a good note in using these webinars to think constructively about what's happening today, critiquing it, thinking differently about it, and then coming up with ideas. So we don't try and solve the world's problems today. What we try and do is raise idea and generate new thoughts and new ways of approaching the subject. Um, I'm delighted to say that we've got another set of panelists cropping up today. Just before we do that though, can I just invite you to uh, help us with a survey, purposeofsecurityresearch.com, myself and Charlotte Howe, what are the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on security? Wherever you are in the world, we'd welcome your involvement. So um, please, please, please do, if you've got 10 minutes, give us your thought on this subject. Now then, today's subject. Today's subject is a really important. It goes something like this. In security, we can't find suitable security talent from diverse background, exposing the illogical. And uh, we've got three panelists who are going to be working with us to discuss these ideas and uh, uh, all experts in different ways. In a minute, I'm gonna do what I always do. I'm gonna invite them to uh, um, introduce themselves. And once they've done that, I'm gonna ask each of them then to make an opening statement. There are three minutes where they get to say what they want to say about this subject matter. And once they've done that, I'll then come to you, the audience, to ask your questions or we'll debate them. So can I invite you please to use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, the Q&A, get your questions on that, get them in early, and I'll endeavor to include them in, discuss in the discussion that ensues. So without further ado, let's meet our panelists and all the way over to South Carolina, I understand, and meet Kathy. Hi, Martin. Thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. I'm Kathy Lavender. I'm the founder and executive director of Security and Investigative Placement Consultant. That's a mouthful, so we typically call ourselves SI Placement. Uh, we are a global search firm that focuses on senior security leadership positions, as well as other supporting roles within the security domain and also business intelligence and investigations. We've operated globally for more than 20 years. Kathy, fantastic, thank you. And you can see why kathy has been invited along. Uh, uh, now back to the United Kingdom and Priya, can you introduce yourself please? Yes, of course. Hi everybody. Um, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to be on the panelist. I'm very much looking forward to it. Uh, so my name is Priya Venkataswamy. I've worked in the security sector for over four years, uh, looking after teams of commissioning engineers with their training and scheduling and supporting the wider operation division at Johnson Controls. Uh, more recently, I moved over to Zitco, who specialise in fire and security recruitment. Um, at present, I am the talent consultant for Zitco Talent. Uh, my role is to recruit fresh new talent uh, into training technical roles within fire, uh, fire and security. Uh, through the Zitco Talent Program. Priya, well, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Excellent. And uh, to Jerry now, thirdly. Jerry, can you introduce yourself, please? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Yeah, Jerry Brennan. I'm the co founder of Security Management Resources. Uh, is... Have you dropped your microphone? I apologize. Ah, uh, much better, Jerry. Anyway, co-founder of the women-owned firm Security Management Resources, also known as SMR Group. We have operations in three hemispheres, and we have done work for over 30% of the uh, Fortune uh, uh, 100 uh, firms throughout the world. Thank you very much indeed, Jerry. You know, I'll tell you something. All over the world, people say, don't we get good panelists? And don't we just proof again? So without further ado, let's go to our first panelist and ask Kathy to, uh, for our opening statement. Kathy, please. Thank you, Martin. The business consulting firm McKinsey and Company has been regularly studying and reporting on diversity and inclusion in the workplace. In May of 2020, their most recent report stated, and I quote, there is ample evidence that diverse and inclusive companies are likely to make better, bolder decisions. The report continued, diverse teams have been shown to be more likely to radically innovate and anticipate shifts in consumer needs and consumption patterns, helping their companies to gain a competitive edge. In my view, all of this is even more important in a time of crisis, such as our current pandemic crisis. 
In 2019, a McKinsey analysis found that companies in the top quartile of gender diversity in terms of executive teams were 25% more likely to experience above average profitability compared to their peers. Furthermore, the higher the representation, the higher the likelihood of outperformance. Many other studies from equally esteemed sources such as the Harvard Business Review have echoed similar findings in the value of diversity and inclusive teams. The bottom line is without question, diversity and inclusion is good for business, whatever your business. As someone who spent 20 plus years recruiting for senior security leadership roles, I can say without a doubt that my clients have benefited from diverse hires. I always say that diversity is in the DNA of SI placement. It's who we are and what we stand for. And not just because I'm a woman who broke into the boys club that dominated security for so long. It's because diverse talent is available and should be considered. Those who say it's hard to find diverse talent are wrong. I look forward to our discussion today and revealing how my team at SI Placement and I have accomplished the results we have. Thank you very much indeed, Kathy. So food for thought there, I appreciate that. So let's go to Priya. Priya, opening statement, please. Thank you. Um, so we're a multicultural society and workplaces should be reflected of this. I think perhaps where the security industry could improve in finding suitable talents is firstly to understand fully the benefits diversity holds. Diversity not only brings new talent, but allows for creativity, better problem solving and higher employee retention, which contributes to creating a more dynamic workforce. It should not be viewed as a tick box exercise to appear like a more diverse workplace. The right actions need to be in place. Therefore, it's crucial that diversity is embedded at the very beginning of any recruitment process. The process needs to be fair and open to everyone. It is imperative that further training is given surrounding diversity, inclusion, and unconscious bias, particularly for hiring managers and for senior le leaders. This is more from an educational perspective to remove any misconceptions or ignorance from the process. It is vital that all backgrounds are welcome and treated equally. If time constraints are the issue, using a good recruitment agency is key. A, competency, a competent agent, sorry, agency will match the brief and present candidates from the wider diverse talent pool that may not have been considered in the first place. The fire and security um, sector is such an incredible industry to work for, but it's not marketed enough. The same view has been expressed by our clients for the importance of bringing new talent who will see the industry with a fresh pair of eyes and uphold the core values of their company. As highlighted by one of our clients, if you bring the same people from the same background all the time, it will be the same re result each time. And this does limit on creativity, problem solving and motivation. Tapping into a diverse talent pool is pivotal to this. Research from the Institute of Engineering and Technology in 2017 have identified there is a skill shortage, particularly in engineering, and further showed that there has been no progress in diversifying engineering and technical workforces. Um, this is why the Zitco Talent Programme was created with a view to solve the engineering crisis and bring more talented candidates within uh, trainee technical roles. A uh, Zitco Talent Programme has enabled us to tap into a market of talented individuals from all diverse um, backgrounds. The application process is open and advertised across all different channels. It does not only promote the industry further, but taps into a wider diverse talent pool, but most importantly, diverse skill sets. This allows us to focus on the individual skill sets, personality through the selection process, regardless of a religion, race, age, or gender to find true talent. It goes without saying with greater diversity comes greater life experiences, opinions, perspectives, skill sets, which help with better decision-making, greater creativity and innovation. From a future perspective, it enables businesses to do more, like more efficient projects and services that resonate with the market. This can only go from strength to strength. Finally, diversity brings people together. It teaches us empathy. It closes the gaps in understanding between different groups of people and it make, and making those barriers easier to break down. Ultimately, it's about bringing everyone together um, and creating a dynamic, robust workforce. We're better when we're united. Thank you, Martin.
Thank you very much indeed, Priya. Can I just say to all the audience, if you can get your questions in using the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, as soon as you can, I'll endeavour to incorporate it in the ensuing discussion. So let's hear from the final panellists. Opening statement, please, Jerry. Thank you. Throughout my entire career, both as a security leader and a hiring manager, executive recruiting and working in government, I've actively worked around diversity issues. We've studied it, we've looked at it, we have felt that as the other panelists have mentioned, um, we have an abysmal record within the uh, security organization. I've lived and worked around the world and observed that diversity is really subjective. It depends on location, goals, things like client tracking requirements due to government uh, regulations. And it, it really is something, as the other panelists have mentioned, that we need to really work on. And it's nice that we observe the problems, but let's get to the core cause of it. For an example, within the uh, security industry, what you have is about 13%, maybe a little more, are diverse. And you then say, why is that? And what we have is we have government agencies that are the primary feeds. We see that roughly anywhere from about 75 to 80% of the professional level positions within the security space, and this is globally, have worked within government, not necessarily retiring, but coming from government. And you look at those agencies and you realize that their diversity percentages are down in that same percentage. The industry mirrors the government. So consequently, we were actually perpetuating the same feed. And then you have to start looking at, well, what are the underlying causes of that? What are we asking for in job descriptions? Most of the industry job descriptions are fundamentally flawed. They contain buzzwords and phrases that may create implicit bias. Um, they're unintentionally discriminatory. They ask for irre irrelevant requirements uh, and certification objectives. So we're really feeding our own problem by not getting to the root cause of these things. Uh, there's one study that was showing that, for an example, women that look at a position do not feel comfortable applying for it unless they feel they have a 90 to 100% match. Conversely, the other studies, and this is within companies and universities, show that males will do that at a 60% match. So consequently, again, this is another example of what, what's happening. Uh, if the role specifier requires a lot of tra travel, single parents may not find it attractive due to family burdens. Uh, again, stating those expectations that are contained within the job description. The language can also do that. Um, and then you go to how the companies position their own materials, their marketing materials, how they're uh, presenting themselves, whether it be the security department or the whole organization. And if those materials will send those subtle messages of bias, uh, if you look at some of the tech companies and it looks more like a frat club, this will also send the wrong message. Jerry, thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, really, really helpful. Those are our three uh, opening statements, everyone. Let's just uh, get a quick response from Kathy, if I might come to you first. Kathy, you painted a very positive picture, but of course, Jerry's just shown up some endemic problems, which I think many of us would relate to. Do you relate to those sorts of issues Jerry was, ra was, was raising there about the state of security recruitment? We've got a lot of ground to cover, a lot of ground to make up. We still do not have the representation of diverse and underrepresented groups that we should have, but I think there is cause for optimism. I think there has been a sea change in attitudes. There is awareness, there is appreciation, um, and there is initiative. Um, you know, my clients talk about diversity and inclusion in every conversation. And I talk about that in every engagement I have. So this would contrast from you know 20 plus years ago when I started doing this, when it just wasn't on anybody's radar screen. 
So, you know, they always say the first uh, uh, way to uh, address a problem is acknowledge you have a problem. So I'm more optimistic and more forward looking. And I'm not looking to bash people or say you've been doing it all wrong. I'm just saying, let's figure out how to move forward and do it right. And I have ideas on how to do it right. So I hope that we can get into those as we go forward. Yeah, okay. I mean, Priya, let me just come to you. I mean, um, isn't it just a fact that the security sector has not been sophisticated enough generally and simply isn't sophisticated enough in its approach to recruitment? Yeah, I think, you know, that everyone in, in the security sector, you know, I've worked in it. We, we all have that understanding. We can all work together. We all are understanding of different cultures. Um, but I think when it comes to engaging with diverse uh, workforces, for example, we have to embed that in the process. It needs to be open and fair to everybody. And it comes back to where I say, you know, embedding that from the very beginning and opening it up and making it um, so that everybody has the opportunity to apply engages more diverse workforce and you're bringing more people in. So, yeah, absolutely. You, you, there, there, there is room for improvement there in order to, you know, engage everybody, but also show the opportunities that the security sector can offer and can provide. Um, so, yeah, certainly. Okay, um, let's go to some questions then. I'll start with you, Jerry, if I might, because sure. uh, um, uh, some of the things you're saying, Jerry, have cropped up in previous webinars in different ways about how right. security needs to be looking different. Uh, um, and uh, one of the questions that Dennis Shep makes uh, um, is about the issue of um, the perception of the security sector. I mean, Jerry, to what extent are these problems a function of the fact that security hasn't really attempted to professionalize in any dynamic way. No, in pockets, absolutely, but not right. as a sector wide in any dynamic way. And this is what you get. That's where we are. Jerry. I think you're spot on. Um, the, uh, they've not, as a profession, defined itself. We, define it in in uh, pockets and we haven't fully defined all of the elements that make up the profession it's extremely diverse and it's not one size fits all and you have to look at the different organizations that have different accountabilities uh you know across the organization we have to break out the skill sets and the competencies necessary and then rethink what we're asking for in the position and say, what is this really needed in today's environment? What's another way to do that? The other issue that we have that builds on that is the fact that uh, because security organizations tend to be somewhat smaller, um, than perhaps other other professions in, in, in corporate settings. Um, there's not many organizations that have both succession planning and developmental planning where you can actually step through in different roles in an organization and not necessarily in a vertical sense. Also, this could be horizontal because security is there to support the business. And they're there to support uh, the business objectives and facilitate uh, doing this with a minimal amount of risk. So consequently, um, we've built these things in jobs uh, in security, looking like it's a reactive uh, program. And we talk about proactivity and there's definitely good examples of it, but what have we done collectively as a profession to uh, to promote that? Yeah, okay, let's come to Kathy then. Kathy, um, what do we need to do then? A couple of things. Um, I think we have to, I'm, I'm not looking to put security in a box and have all of these requirements and certifications right. and expectations. I'm looking to open the aperture and bring a big tent together. So most of my clients say first and foremost, they would like a business leader, someone who understands business, who, who speaks the language of business, 
and has some knowledge and expertise in security. Does that mean that they have to know everything about security? No. So we, we start from that perspective. We look at the job descriptions, as Jerry mentioned. You know, are you using outmoded thinking? Is there inherent bias in your job description? We have to look in non-traditional places, not just law enforcement and government, but across all sectors and all industries. Because I don't see anywhere that there's proof positive that you have to have worked in a sector to be successful in a sector. We shouldn't overlook the military post-military talent pool. That's a really diverse and rich recruiting ground. We have to reach out to organizations that uh, communicate and serve underrepresented groups. In the US, we talk about historically black universities and colleges. Certainly there are associations, forums and listservs that are targeting minorities. You have to, as a, a, a recruiter, a talent acquisition person or an HR specialist or even a hiring manager, broaden your network to reach into diverse communities. You have to advertise your openings so that people hear about them, people that are not part of your tight circle, your usual suspects. Employers have to hire with a development mindset in some cases, because there could be a really good diverse candidate um, who meets seven out of 10 and with some education, training and mentoring would be just fantastic in that role. And then we have to move beyond those quick evaluations of CVs and resumes, where if you don't see it right off the top, you just put it aside. If you actually talk to those diverse people, understand that a resume is a one dimensional tool and it may not communicate everything, you can open up again, the aperture, which is important. Then I would say you have to not be lazy. This is hard work. It is not easy. It takes a lot of effort and I think it's worth the effort. And that is why I take this, this posture. Finally, I would say you can't be exploitive. Don't just introduce a diverse candidate for the sake of diversity. You know, that may fulfill some sort of requirement you have to have a diverse pool, but you know that person isn't ready or the best qualified, don't do it. It's the lazy way out again. And I think a lot of this comes down to effort. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Priya, let me come to you on this because uh, uh, Halda Al-Hakim has made this point about recruiting from other areas, which Kathy just uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, commented on. I mean, mm -hmm. what's been coming up, and we know, don't we? There's a heavy emphasis on the sort of law enforcement, government, military of various descriptions. To what extent can we begin to solve this problem, of, you know, by looking proactively without it? And to what extent is that happening proactively? Yeah, no, um, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, I, I do have to echo with what Kathy said. It, it is about reaching out to different channels and advertising to the different areas as well. But it's, it's something that has to be consistent. Um, you know, we, we want to reach uh, as many people as possible, but give them that opportunity and make it fair across the board. And I think that is really important. Um, um, I think also, you know, at the moment, what we're doing, especially with the Zitco Talent Programme, is that uh, we are making that process um, open as much as possible by uh, not only advertising in different channels, we, we work with women in construction, uh, women's security, we're also part of the armed forces government. Um, we're actively making sure that we are looking at every different area and that we are advertising for those that want that opportunity to come into security as part of this training program. You know, they would be getting training and, and coming in at a trainee role, um, but it's an ongoing thing and it's really important that we continue to do that. And again, what Kathy said, it is hard work. You have to continue ensuring to make sure that you get the right person. It's not about ticking a box. Uh, you could be a, a, a company looking to bring on people from a diverse background, but it has to be for the right reasons, because ultimately they may not have the right skill set. Um, and what you're doing is you're impacting employee retention because they, they may leave as a result of that. So it is really, really key that we are focusing on the right channels and we're actively doing that consistently as well um, and making sure that we are engaging with all the different diverse channels that we can to ensure that. 
Uh, and, and, you know, I do have to echo diversity is not just in security, it's all different industries. All different industries have to make that change too, you know, uh, they have to tap into that market. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Jerry, I'm going to come to you with a question I had actually lined up myself, but um, not, not untypically, Rachelle Lawyer, who was a panellist a few weeks ago, says it better. Yeah. And she's talking about this difficulty of talking about diversity. And um, uh, Rachelle calls it the sort of eye roll response, which you, which you come yeah. across. And um, it, it is a little bit of a tricky one to discuss sometimes, and particularly a difficult one perhaps to discuss uh, when it's a challenge in an organisation. Uh, do you, do you recognise that as being an issue, uh, Jerry? And um, is there, a, is there a, a way of managing this that's going to actually bring about some sort of change? We can say it's not right, but there's a certain um, difficulty many people have. Jerry? I think, yes, that is a great question on this topic. Um, we find that if we take the lead um, in discussing diversity in a broader context, rather than just gender or race, um, in one of the uh, uh, panelists had mentioned earlier about uh, the diversity of backgrounds and ideas and so forth, um, that that tends to open up the conversation a bit. And there's, I think, some subtleties that uh, you can use to, to really engage with that. We still, of course, have the, the classic issue where people feel that it's some sort of a checkbox uh, that somebody's trying to, trying to do, and Kathy made the point. You don't just check the box. You have to really engage with it uh, in a very passionate sense um, because as was mentioned earlier, having a diverse uh, team is better for business. It makes a better team. Okay, Jerry, thank you very much. I mean, uh, um, interesting point. And there is this emphasis coming from all three of you. We've got to focus on this. We've got to uh, uh, take it as a, 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 an exercise in its own right. And then we come to you, Kathy, with a similar question, but a slightly different emphasis from Tim Graham. Um, isn't the concept of diversity for the sake of it a bit dangerous? All this does is give HR departments check boxes to fill out without giving attention to the qualifications. Where I'm going with this is that we are now leaning towards skin color and sex as primary uh, pr premier qualifications themselves, are we not? And I think the point is, Cathy, it's not so much in the sorts of companies that you deal with, which are obviously taking on you and so they're taking it seriously, but about a the broader security sector where there aren't the uh, Kathy Lavenders of the world at work. You know, I don't know what's in people's hearts. All I know is what they say to me. And uh, consistently, I hear a genuine desire to look more broadly, consider people who are from different backgrounds, uh, and embrace this moment, this moment of change. And I think, um, you know, I can't impugn their motives. I think their motives are good. And I'm actually less worried about, you know, the downside that we've, we've kind of gone too far over the bend because we never went too far down this road before. Um, so I will just say that, you know, from many, many years of experience, I have seen the benefit. My clients have seen the benefit. It's real. This is a genuine response. This is a genuine impulse. And it's an important moment in the, you know, in the world at this time to do it. So I'm less concerned about any other atmospherics. And I just want the best people in the best positions and and doing the best job they can, because we have a lot of risks right now. The world has never been in quite this place before. And security has really risen to the occasion and really, really done an amazing job to get their organizations through this pandemic, civil unrest, you know, all the unemployment, all the things that are, 
are um, causing us so much pain these days. So I want us all to succeed and we all succeed when we are all working together and diversity is one part of that. Okay, uh, Priya, uh, um, Michael Gibbs says, uh, um, also a former panelist uh, and a future one actually, isn't uh, a big problem a lack of imagination by HR staff? Uh, um, they have a tick box approach to hiring and are loads look out for this box of skills and talents. They want hard experience. This is a point actually, I think, that um, others have made too. Uh, uh, um, and Michael uh, 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 Bell, if I can just read you his question, Priya, says, it's one of the things is that we're placing ex-forces police um, um, as preferred on job ads. Um, and you appreciate that uh, um, there's a reason to, to not have this. But the truth of the matter is that can put off care that's not applying. We, the fact of the matter is that's the emphasis. HR are, are, are lazy and um, we've really got an endemic problem here we've got to tackle. I'll come to Jerry afterwards um, on the same question first. Priya. Yeah, I think it does come back to sort of the opening statement uh, in where I mentioned it really has to be sort of embedded in the process. I think it's that education of why we bring in diversity. It's that understanding as to what it holds and it's looking at the process properly, making it very open um, and uh, accessible to everybody. And I think, yes, the, there is a tendency, but then this is where it may come into making job descriptions more generic so that it makes uh, it will help other people to apply and everyone to apply. It's about using the right language um, as well, uh, the tone of the message as well, but also an opportunity to promote the company and what it can offer for an individual, because that is what would make a, a person apply in the first place. Um, again, tapping into those channels uh, of making sure that we are be making sure it's accessible to everyone and anyone and it's that continuity it is a work in progress it's still uh, lots of ways to go but you know engaging with HR and finding creative ways to do so is also key in that um, and you know perhaps um, having that conversation you know we, we want to make the workplace more diverse how do we do that and engaging with the HR division to do that um, can help too having that open communication I think is really key but you see, I think on the front line, though, Priya, yeah. there is this sense when there's commercial realities. Okay? Yeah. This is, um, margins are often not great in the security world. There's commercial realities. Mm -hmm. And one can see how one can quickly fall into very nice things to do, Priya, Cathy, Jerry. They're all sort of on the right lines here. But yeah. listen, I need this person quick. Former police military uh, are reliable. Let's go down there. Sorry about these nice ideas. There's commercial realities at work here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, in terms of skill set, that's always going to be really, really important. But then again, I think it does come down to branching to, you still have to make sure that process is fair for everybody so that they can apply. So whether they are from a military or ex forces background, you're giving them like everyone that opportunity. Yes. Skill set is very important. Having worked in the industry, I value uh, the engineer and their work experience. That is essentially really key. But again, I guess if you're looking sort of in the future and I perhaps maybe are talking about building a model of training where you are getting the right person, then it becomes about the training and giving in those qualifications to do so. Um, so I think, yes, it, it, for uh, like for immediately, um, we still have to tap in and make it wider. Skill sets are really important, but giving an opportunity to a person is as well. Um, and we have to channel those two together. Okay, fair enough, and, and thank you very much indeed. Jeremy, come to this point about former police and military. I mean, you mentioned about the fact sure. that if we recruit from the government, we recruit from what they do, you're going to get the same result. Get that point. Right. But you can see why people do, can't you? I mean, there's, there's, they're known to be reliable. They're known to have similar skill sets. It's easier. I'm going to slice this up a bit. I think the skill sets are different. There are elements, depending on what agency that you work for, that are transferable skill sets. When you look at some of the soft skills, management skills, people problems, uh, dealing with crises in a calm manner, understanding the degree of impact that your decisions have, uh, 
when you work at a senior level with one of these agencies, whatever it is anywhere in the world, you understand the political ramifications as you would in, in a company. Um, and companies can feel very good about that. Unfortunately, the profession has focused more on the reactive areas in, in this. And so we have a narrative that suggests that because you have been in law enforcement, that this is what security is. And I go back to uh, something that we, we said very early on uh, to ASIS when they were, we, we were working on putting together the CSO guidelines and so forth, that, you know, stop talking to ourselves you have to get out there and define the profession and then start defining it and educating the rest of the community and your clients outside of the security community. Uh, we're just, we're in this vicious cycle of, uh, of talking to ourselves and doing the same thing. And the other point I was going to make, and as I said, separate it was that there is an advantage when you have somebody coming out of, let's say, one of the intelligence communities and so forth, that you know that they're fairly well vetted. And because of various clearances and depending on what their activities were, um, there, there is a, a vetting process um, that doesn't necessarily exist for somebody that grew up within the industry. And the industry does have its Achilles heel. I mean, I can think of a dozen cases off the top of my head of, of ethical problems with people in security. Um, and interesting, the majority of those cases were people that did not necessarily spend time coming from, let's say, an intelligence agency or a, a federal uh, level. Uh, law enforcement uh, career. So, you know, we we need to redefine this. We need to get the message out there. Yeah. Okay. And um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, interesting answer. Um, and Priya, can we come to you next? A question from, and then I'll come to you, Kathy. I will. I want to get this question in from Ryan Mason because I think it's uh, um, an interesting one. And Ryan's question, Priya, is how do I, as a mid-career security professional, uh, with a relevant security uh, qualification, but no military law enforcement make myself stand out to get to the executive director level. Now, um, uh, to what extent is that gonna be a barrier? Doesn't mention anything about uh, diversity here. Priya, just a point about how you get through this security hierarchy. Yeah, I think, you know, in terms of the qualifications that you exist, like you have existingly on your CV, uh, making sure that that is organized and it's to the top of your level of experience. But I think uh, in the industry, it's checking out all the opportunities that there are available in a senior position within the security sector. Uh, and I think it's really going for it and um, asking advice from people, finding out uh, where there are the uh, sort of jobs available, uh, also asking some senior members how they how they got to their positions as well. I think it is a work in progress. It takes a bit of time, um, but it certainly can be done if you're motivated and and that's your kind of goal and vision as as, uh, as to where you want to go and work into senior uh, sort of senior management. Then certainly you should go for it um, and and you know get that sort of advice and 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 get the ball rolling by asking questions and finding out what opportunities are out there. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Very quick, I'm going to ask you, Cathy, I'm going to ask you quickly, but I'm going to ask you to be quick and you answer you wouldn't mind, Cathy, because I want to get a bit more in because I'm running out of time. A quick question about, um, right, so it's, the, the sense is that despite the wisdom of what you're saying about the benefits of diversity, we're still not diverse. And you've given a characterization or an approach which says these are the things you can do. What's the key route to selling that message? I mean, why is it not obvious, Cathy? <laughs> I think it is. And I think people are, are you know, that, well, I think that light bulb is going on in a lot of places right now. So I'm more encouraged than I ever have been. And, you know, I'm not a Pollyanna, but I can see the results. In the last year or so, maybe 18 months, of the top 10 searches that my firm has done for 
the number one position, chief security officer, whatever you want to call it, of, of those 10, six of the selected candidates were either female or um, African American or other uh, minority group. So I'm seeing the proof in the pudding where people are making this breakthrough and companies are driving this. So I'm more optimistic. Now we're at a granular, granular level, more at the hiring manager level. Um, Jerry talked about how people are talking amongst themselves all the time. I think there's still too much hiring amongst themselves. No. Um, yeah. Go to their known cohort. Yeah. Um, and I've seen, you know, this is not a knock on these agencies, but I will name right. them US, where you will see entire security programs where everyone has an FBI background or a secret right. service background. And they're right. kind of monolithic and probably a little bit groupthink as a result. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Jerry, I'm going to come to you with a final question. I'm going to ask you just to be very brief because I want to get a final comment from okay. the panelists in. Uh, it's from Peter Trim. You mentioned the issue about um, how we define security. And Peter Correct. Trim and Simon Cham also picks up on this point. Um, a quick question. To what extent is this an image problem with the security sector of itself and from outside? To what extent, if we solve that, are we going to go a long way to solving this diversity issue? I think it is a key step. Um, it, it's a multifaceted uh, correction, of course, but I think that the definition and selling and marketing it and talking outside the community to define it um, is, you have to do that if you want to, to uh, implement change. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Panis, we've just got a, a, a minute left, so I'm going to ask you each in just 10 seconds, that's all you got for this final answer, 10 seconds, uh, um, uh, headline issues, strategic issues, what are the key things the security sector needs to do to benefit from this diversity that you've been talking about? Key things they need to do at a strategic level. Priya first. It needs to be embedded into the recruitment process. I think further training, uh, covering sort of diversity and inclusion and conscious bias to raise awareness um, and the importance that it brings. And I think you have to look at the future. Um, you know, there are multiple studies and, and things Kathy and Jerry have mentioned of the benefits of diversity um, and really increasing pro productivity, profits, engagement, employee turnover. In the long term, it has a massive benefit and it needs to be looked into. Thank you, Priya. That wasn't a real 10 seconds. Jerry, I'm going to ask you for a real 10 seconds. Uh, <laughs> I need to, Jerry, please. Very simply, the industry has to specifically target uh, and go after it and aggressively in a proactive fashion. Yeah, OK, makes sense to me. And uh, I'm going to leave the final word to you, Cathy. You helped me put this idea together and uh, it came out of a conversation we had. Cathy, your final 10 seconds, please. Thank you, Martin. It's possible. I've seen it done. I see it every day. And it, there has to be a will. And where there's a will, there's a way. And we are moving in the right direction. So have faith and keep at it because it's not easy. Thank you very much indeed. Panis, that was absolutely superb. Thank you very much indeed, all three of you, for your comments. It was a very active on chat, very active on questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to every single question, but I did my best. Uh, um, so uh, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And I'm sure we're going to come back to this in uh, future weeks as well. Uh, um, just very, very quickly, a few final points, if I might uh, indulge you. The OSPAS virtual award ceremony, the UK OSPAS, live on Thursday, the 25th of February, 3.30. It's the same time on a Thursday afternoon. Need to register. And I tell you what, you're going to see uh, some outstanding performances. You're going to see an amazing show. And you're also going to see security sector behaving in a way that will surprise you. Attend the award ceremony, the UK OSPAS, on the 25th of February. Um, the OSPAS are still open in Nigeria and South Africa. They close soon, though, so do get your entries in in Nigeria and South Africa. Look out, there's more uh, entries opening soon in other countries. We'll be announcing them here. Um, just to say that we go through all again on Thursday morning. And on Thursday of this week, it's in the morning, 9.30 Greenwich Mean Time, is about managing staff travel. What are the security implications in this new normal? Uh, we hear about staff traveling and going to conferences and going abroad. And we'll be talking about uh, what the issues are with another international set of panelists. Uh, and next week, we're going to be looking at mindfulness. So uh, do tune in uh, normal time next week, but 9.30 on Thursday morning, 
it'd be great to see you there if you can. Well, thank you very much indeed once again to my audience. Thank you once again to the panelists. Thank you to Christine Brooks and Hannah Miller in the background. Uh, hopefully we'll see you Thursday morning at 9.30. But uh, until we meet again, wherever you are in the world, stay safe.